Ocarina of Time was the perfect game for me. I look at it with hardcore nostalgic glasses and often overlook its flaws, but generally I'm okay with that. Everyone has a game that falls into that category for them, and the memories simply overpower everything else. But for as much as I enjoyed the game, I honestly can say I knew next to nothing about it before it launched. I had played A Link to the Past, but that was pretty much about it. Due to not having the internet or access to any sort of external gaming media, I was in the dark. And I had no idea what came before the final product. The timeline of the game's development was lost to me as a kid, and I only began to start hearing about things long after I had completed the game. Being the hopeless nostalgia buff that I am, seeing the early renditions and leftover concepts that lingered before the game launched was kind of surreal. Some of them sparked weird mysteries, but most just felt like an untouchable part of history. And in a game focused around time travel, I would have done anything to go back in time to check out what could have been. And somehow, closing in on 22 years later, we've finally been given that opportunity. We've been given access to one of the early dungeons that was scrapped from the game. So I hope you enjoy this look back at what is basically the equivalent to a lot of us for bringing old photos to life. This is the Lost Dungeon of The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time. So before starting at all, it's incredibly important to highlight the people who made this possible. There was a massive leak on the web that had tons of old Nintendo assets, which were used to compile what you're seeing today. When the leaks hit the web, a lot of the assets were in relatively unusable forms though. There were pieces and parts that essentially need to be stitched together. What you're seeing today is a restoration attempt at putting these assets back together in the way they used to be utilized. Z64.me recreated the collision for the map files, while Zell managed to locate the original actors and object layouts in the binaries. With this, Z64.me was able to piece together the area and mimic the feeling those old photographs had, utilizing a lot of the old models for characters that were eventually redone. So a huge thanks to them for all their efforts on this, alongside anyone else who contributed in some way. It's not a one-to-one -one recreation as there is some improvising, but it's certainly impressive. But with that, let's take a peek into the past. As we start off, the dungeon places us in a room with two doors that we can choose from. Giant stone torches decorate the sides of the room, and there's a sense of power here. Whether Link chooses left or right, both doors lead to similar situations. Link finds himself in a curved hallway with a flaming keys. At the end of this hallway is something a bit bizarre though. Strange torches that have faces carved into them. The visage lacks eyes and many details, but it does have a red flowing tongue that is on the ground. However, upon entering the next room, it's clear that these torches do have eyes in some instances, and they are very eerie. But probably what is even more startling for most of us is the fact that this room has the iconic Elisreal 2401 texture etched onto a stone plaque in the center. This texture of course appeared in Ocarina of Time's final build too, as a plaque in Dodongo's cavern. Entering this room immediately spawns a Stalfos for us to fight, and since the old Stalfos model was also found within the files, just labeled as Skeleton, it was implemented over the modern day Stalfos enemy and animations. It's not an exact recreation because it's using the current animations, but it still sells the experience a bit. When going through the files, the enemy and object layout data was discovered so placement could be mimicked. With a few well-timed hits, the Stalfos falls, and we are able to continue on in the dungeon. So something I find interesting in this room is that there are three doors total, but the carpet is laid out on the ground as if there is four. For clarity, the first two hallways in this dungeon lead to the doors on the opposite sides of the room, and the door that is up the set of stairs is what takes us forward. But this back wall, there's just something about it that says I'm a secret entrance. Whether it be the carpet leading up to it, or just how the wall juts out like around all the other doors, it makes me wonder what this was once for. Granted, I also want to know what this dungeon was for. The decorations are pretty interesting to say the least, and it certainly gives off hardcore Gandorf castle vibes, which are further solidified once we proceed onward. Because the next area is a giant curved staircase that pretty much mimics the intermediate staircase we find in Gandorf's castle. Grid torches and all. Kinda neat to see that they lived on in the final version, but it makes me wonder if this castle was meant to be Gandorf's or Hyrule Castle when it was this early in development. Even the door on top of the mini staircase in the previous room mimics how Gandorf's castle rooms are laid out too, like in the boss key room, where Link normally fights Stalfos. The way forward is always raised up on a mini staircase. These early assets certainly lived on, and it's only fitting that we encounter an armor-clad knight at the top of the staircase, just like we encounter the two iron knuckles in Gandorf's. Our beta foe is a lot different though, almost dark nut-like in appearance. Now, what you're seeing here isn't actually the true form of this enemy, which is labeled as Iron Knack in the files. The sword he's wielding is a bit of a fan service just to get the model in working order. Sword textures are found in the game files, but a sword model wasn't. 
In fact, Iron Neck basically had two left arms, so when compiled, they held two shields. To fit the build of an Iron Knuckle and get it working in the game, the sword was improvised just so the Iron Knuckle enemy animations could be applied to the rig. So, keep that in mind. Alongside this, the link you're seeing is a recreation based off the old photos, as the model was not from the leaks. Assets, like the flames on the pillars, are leftover used animation assets that didn't make it into the final build, so it is neat to see them restored. But I digress. This is the largest room in the dungeon. It features an upper balcony that overlooks the room and two paths to choose from. If we duel our golden friend, he follows a similar combat mechanics as an Iron Knuckle since he is currently utilizing the animation set. However, upon defeat, it makes me wonder if that gray square that is in front of him once held a treasure chest. It seems like an accurate spawning location, or at least at first glance it does. So something to note about this room is that the files found within the game actually did not have any bell of any kind in this room at all. However, the old photos showed off the placement of the Iron Knack. So it was placed here. Zelda Enthusiast Cell released a video showcasing the most accurate object layouts, and it appears that the only thing these rooms contained file-wise was a backwards treasure chest on top of the balcony. In this room, if you were to head through the right door, you'd go through a hallway that would loop around to the top part of the balcony. This is where this chest was located, but if Link actually tried to interact with it, the game would instantly softlock. When making this video, we were constantly going back and forth, trying to figure out if the original beta screenshots did have the chest in them. And after recreating the same angle in the game, and realizing the gray part of the door would be visible, it turns out that it's actually pretty convincing that the chest was always there in the beta photos, just hidden within the blurred mess that they were. We would have never known otherwise, which is pretty neat. One thing to keep in mind is that other than the Stolfo spawns and treasure chests, not a whole lot was left over in these files. The keys and other enemies were added to this rebuild to make things feel more lifelike based off the old photos, but they certainly aren't accurate to what we actually had access to. In the actor list, there are lots of unset objects though, and data for what appears to be slime and baby skeleton enemies. For the sake of showcasing unrelated beta findings, models were replaced so that the feel of the game could be replicated, which goes hand in hand with our next section, a different variant of a winding staircase that had improvised floor masters added for the fun of it. This area is actually the first time we leave the castle and are outside. The rim of the castle can be seen above us and beyond that is the sky. However, this is brief, because a moment later, we enter another room within the tower. In Z64.me's recreation of this room, he reskinned Moblins from the Lost Woods and added them within this glowing area. It makes for an interesting fight for sure, but this room in particular is bizarre. Normally, the only thing here is a treasure chest that was softlock link, but the whole area is encompassed in light from a circular red carpet. It's kind of strange. Like, what was the purpose of this lit up area? It seems awfully small to be a fighting area, similar to the Rings of Fire or other types of barriers that Zelda games like to trigger. The completed area is almost as wide as the floor, so it's perplexing. But beyond the double doors to the right of the room, lead us to the final area in this strange dungeon. Once Link heads through the double doors, he spit back outside onto another spiral staircase. But this time, following the staircase around eventually leads to the summit of the castle. The roof has been reached and it's a bit bleak, but not long after we arrive, a Stalfos encounter would take place. This is showcased in Zell's coverage of the level, and it sort of acts as the dungeon boss in some regards. It's strange though, because it truly makes me wonder what the original intentions were for this area. Back in the day, Link would have been progressing up here for at least some sort of reason I assume, and given the scale of the top of the castle, it would certainly make sense that a fight would take place up here. But was this an endgame encounter, or something planned for the beginning? Honestly, we could be giving too much merit to this entire dungeon as well. It could have simply been an area developed just to test a Zelda game's capabilities within a 3D engine. But there's something surreal about standing on top of this deserted castle that's been dormant for years. It's like a parallel universe to a game I truly love. This dungeon is really only the start of piecing together what this game used to be though, and I hope you enjoy my further deep dives into what Ocarina of Time has to offer. If you'd like to tag along for that ride, subscribe now to stay tuned. And with that, a huge shout out to Z64.me and Zell for helping out with this video. You can find links to both of their channels in the description below. Thanks for watching guys and gals, and until my next video, cheers.